Welcome to the Tudor Dixon Podcast, where we bring you stories of great Americans. And I've met some amazing people across the state of Michigan, and I just feel like I need to share those people with you. Some of them have become a part of me. And you know, when someone finds a permanent home in your heart, you know that that story just needs to be told. And my guest today is definitely one of those people. From the moment I met him, you could just feel... I think what I can only describe as this intense energy coming from him, he's an American hero, a leader, a top military strategist, a loving father, loyal husband, and strong man of faith. I want to welcome the author of Zero Percent Chance and Purple Heart recipient, Major Jonathan Turnbull, to the podcast. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, ma'am. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I am so excited to have you. I want to talk about your book, and I'm going to hold it up here. This is such an amazing piece of work because I think what people need to understand is this is truly the raw, unedited story of what it is to serve in so many ways. It's not just your story of what you've gone through, but it really is the story of how a military family handles these missions. I love the way you start out the book talking about your childhood and something stuck out to me that I want to go through because your parents actually took you out of school. You said you weren't doing well in school and if it were today's world, you'd be medicated. You would have been told you had ADD and you would be medicated and you'd be a different person. But the ADD part of you, that part of you that has that get up and go is what drove you to really become this American hero. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. So tell me a little bit about that. Your parents, I, your parents are incredibly adorable and sweet people. Your mom is so awesome. They, she, I think I met her before I met you and she was clearly just completely in love with you and talked about you in such an amazing way. But she was your champion very young. So tell me how she made that decision and what that was like for you. Because you said instead of traditional book learning, you kind of learn by doing. Yes. My mom is a big believer in uh, like a hands-on approach to learning. And as, as you mentioned, like I was struggling in school, um, attended a public school until fourth grade. Uh, and yeah, it was fifth grade. Um, when my mom and my dad sat down, we had the conversation, like, how are we going to continue education, you know, continue in the public school, which was not working for me, or, or do we find a way that does work and, um, make me more successful that way so that we decided, I mean, there's always a path to success. Um, There's always an answer uh, for whatever questions we have. You just have to, sometimes you have to dig deep and figure it out. And I know it was a tough question for them to uh, tackle, but um, they decided the best bet was to pull me out and to homeschool me. And their method of teaching, we did, I mean, we got into books. My mom was a librarian. Uh, She's been working at the library. She still works at the library. Uh, she's been there for as long as I can remember, um, loves books. So our daily school, we'd go to the library. She'd be like, pick a book, sit down, start reading. You know, I'll come back in a little bit of time. And it was great, but uh, it wasn't just this hands-on approach reading books. I mean, we did, we did, uh, got into mathematics and um, other core subjects. But when we got into things like geography and history, my mom's a historian and loves history. And um, one thing I took after was history. Uh, She said, all right, um, I remember one of our very first ones, Gettysburg. We were learning about the Civil War. What can we learn about Gettysburg? You know, we watched the movies, um, loved watching the old fashioned, you know, uh, blue and gray. And then we watched um, Little Round Top and, you know, these great movies. read the books about him, um, about Joshua Chamberlain and Battle for a Little Round Top and stuff. And then she's like, all right, you've read about it. Let's go go see it. So he filled up the car. um, And by this time, my mom is homeschooling my sister as well. We drove to Gettysburg and we spent two or three days walking the battlefields. Um, It wasn't just Gettysburg. Uh, At one point, she decided when we were learning about out west, we read all the Lord Ingalls Wilder books and we started reading quite a bit about the mountain men and, you know, the uh, westward expansion of the United States. So we jumped in the car again and we drove out west. We went and we saw the Grand Canyon. I got to see um, Yellowstone, Old Faithful. We visited 
Mount Rushmore. And I mean, so my parents are very big into this hands-on approach. Um, the biggest thing they did for me was uh, learning about our heritage, where my family came from. And uh, my family originally came from Scotland uh, prior to the revolution, fought, fought with uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie during the Jacobite Rebellion. And uh, oh, wow, when, that is very cool. Yeah, when England overcame uh, the Scots, the uh, they kicked out a lot of them, and our family was one of them. They kicked out, and they sent them, you know, sent them to this the New World, America. Not a bad, not a bad deal, I don't think. Um, but my it's family, like the Outlander story. I don't know if you've ever seen any yeah, it's, of that, but that really is. That's that's the Outlander story, yeah. which I think a lot of people connect to. But so did Fantastic. that then lead you to say? I want to follow in those footsteps and I want to fight as well. I want to be out there as a, as a hero for my people. Absolutely. Um, one thing that definitely sparked it, uh, and trying try to practice brevity, um, everybody's seen the movie Braveheart with Mel Gibson, you know, freedom, he holds his sword up, it's great. Well, <laughs> great movie. Um, the king, King Robert the Bruce in that movie, uh, later after William Wallace was executed, Robert the Bruce won a great battle, won a victory over England. England granted Scotland, uh, the, you know, their right to rule their own country, and King Robert the Bruce was crowned the king. He was later riding on a hunting trip with a bunch of his his knights, and during this hunting trip, of all things, a Scottish cow charged him, knocked him from his horse, and started to gore him on the ground. At which point, one of the young squires jumped off his horse grabbed the cow by the horns, turned it, killed the bull, but saved the king's life. Um, the young man's name was William Rule, and uh, King Robert the Bruce knighted him Turnbull and gave him lands in Scotland. So that's where the name Turnbull comes from, because a young man turned the bull. And uh, But my family, they started out fighting. Uh, that young man fought in the Scottish Rebellion or War for Independence. Um, later on, like I said, that when the Jacobite Rebellion happened, my family rose up in the rebellion, joined the other clans and fought the English, got cast out of Scotland, moved to North America. Once again, not a bad deal. Um, and 1776 rolls around, another chance for the English. So my family joined up, they were true patriots, fought uh, in many of the battles. My mom is very uh, read into the lines that our family did, they fought there. Uh, family again fought in War of 1812 down in Louisiana. Joined, uh, my family were Louisianans, um, lived north of New Orleans. Passed through until the next big war, uh, the I mean, Civil War. My family fought again the Civil War. Uh, unfortunately fought for the wrong side in my opinion. Um, lost that one. And they were deported from the south to northern uh, northern parts of Texas, so I mean still south, but um, Texas, and then parts of Michigan. Um, they started moving up to Michigan, and my grandfathers were both uh, ardent patriots. My paternal grandfather he fought in Vietnam, and after Vietnam, moved his family from Texas to Alpena, up here in northern Michigan, where he retired from the Air Force and became a pastor. So they my Dad's side of the family stayed here forever. This background, it really, it really goes to who you are and how you became this leader in our armed for forces. And I want to get to a little bit about your story because it's just so amazing what you were able to do. And, and I think that we can't really understand it without what you just told us. It, so, I, because reading your book, I am in my heart, I'm saying, how do you how do you become this person that says, I am going to continue to go mission after mission? And you discuss that in detail about what it is to leave your family behind and, and the strength of a military spouse, but then that desire to go out there and, and just continue with the mission. And, and oftentimes you volunteered to go out and, and do these missions. So tell us a little bit about your service and, and this last deployment that you had. So a quick rundown of me, my service. Um, I mean, you've heard my backstory. I knew I was going to do something. I was either going to be a police officer. I mean, what kid doesn't want to be a soldier? I mean, either a Marine or in the Army. I mean, it's pretty awesome. Um, I remember 9-11 was a really important day for me um, in 2001. 
I was working at our local pool. I was a lifeguard because it's awesome. And my boss comes running in and said, John, get into the office real quick. And I thought I was in trouble. I was like, oh, no, she's angry about something. So I go in and I remember it clear as day. The second the, I walked in right as the second plane hit the um, second trade center and watched them collapse. And my boss is like, we're at war. We just got attacked. And I knew at that moment, I was like, I'm not going to stand for this. Well, I mean, I will stand, but I'm not going to allow injustice to be made. I will go and you know protect freedom. I want to promote justice and the American way of life. So I raised my right hand and I swore to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I swore to bear true faith and allegiance to the same, the same uh, oath that every soldier takes. Uh, joined the Army in 2005 when I graduated high school. Uh, was accepted to the United States Military Academy at West Point which I think I'm required to say, go Army, beat Navy. Um, we, we love we love our <laughs> Navy veterans as well, but, you know, football's, football's football. It is what it is. But I graduated from West Point in 2010, commissioned a second lieutenant. And we'll do a quick history on that. Uh, second lieutenant was an armor officer, went to 3rd Infantry Division in Fort Stewart, Georgia, where I got my, you know, first experience leading soldiers, great experience. Uh, my short term there ended uh, with a deployment in Afghanistan 2012 to 2013 up in regional command north uh, a beautiful area where uh, a lot was happening but there's a lot more like under the water than it's at surface value at surface um, is going on a lot of infrastructure being done stuff people were working to improve the way of life of the civilians the local Afghanis to make it so that they can have a better life. Their kids can go to school. Their, you know, women can work. Uh, something that was unheard of there. So I think that's something that I, I want to tap into a little bit because a lot of people are obviously talking about Afghanistan and the, yes. the removal of our troops there. But you were, you saw what was going on. What was happening on the ground there was more than just fighting an enemy. It was building. It was a building the country. country, and it was. Uh, I mean, the age-old adage, you know, you know, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Give him, you know, teach a man to fish. The same thing. We were there. We were teaching them. We were not just in teaching, encouraging them. Mm. Hey, you don't have to take this. Stand up. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to be pushed around, bullied. Stand up. Put your foot down. Say no. And act. And not just, and we weren't doing it just with the military and the police, the Afghan police or the Afghan border um, guards, but we were in the houses of the people, um, talking with the wives, talking with the mothers. Uh, I went to schools and you would talk with the kids. Uh, girls weren't allowed to attend school. Same thing with my final deployment. Girls weren't allowed to attend schools. So we said, why not? And they're like, bad people say they can't go. I was like, well, there's, you know, new kids are on the block. We're here. Let's change this, let's, you know, remove the fear um, that these terrorist organizations impose upon the, you know, common day people, good, innocent people. If we can remove the fear, we can give them, you know, a leg up. They can stand up and it promotes freedom, promotes justice in the area where they haven't seen any of this. You know, it gives them a chance. That's what we're looking for, giving them a chance. And same thing in Afghanistan. When you look at what happened in Afghanistan, what does that, what kind of feelings does that bring up inside of you? Because now we're hearing that these girls are no longer allowed to attend school, that things have really very quickly reversed. So how do you feel about that? You're, you're going to get me all fired up. I love it. Um, <laughs> it was, it's very, very difficult to see. And I compare it quite a bit with, um, mm -hmm the fall of Saigon in Vietnam. And I spent a lot of time with our veterans. That's one way I can cope now is, you know, sit down with our Vietnam veterans, with Gulf War guys. I mean, I love our World War II vets, not many out there. So if you get a chance to talk to them, you know, hear what they have to say, because they're amazing. But yeah, we, we stepped away. It was a betrayal, not just to the Afghan people, but to every American that has served over there uh, I feel because, I mean, we lost, we lost some great people. I mean, the, I mean, the feelings mm -hmm. that I have for it, like can't be expressed. I mean, I'll get all choked up here, 
so I'll say a couple deep breaths, but uh, I mean, men fought and died. Men and women fought and died to defend America, defend America from the, the, you know the evil, this evil regime known as the Taliban, um, terrorist organization, and for uh, for us just to pack it up and walk away. I we should we should be embarrassed, and uh, I have people come up to me and apologize for what our politicians did and. It makes, I mean, it is a step in the right direction. I like that people recognize what has happened. But at the end of the day, remember, we were talking about it when I was still in the Army when um, the withdrawal was happening. And we were like, Biden, Biden stood, President Biden stood up and said, there's no way to leave this country. We can't do it. Um, and I disagreed with them. I think that there, there's only one way that you can withdraw from a country such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and that's uh, once we've won. And it makes me think of another silly thing everybody knows about. Um, if at first you don't succeed, uh, try, try again. Hmm. But I would also change it. If at first you don't succeed, redefine success. So that way you do succeed. I mean, redefine your parameters. This is what we need to have happen. With Afghanistan, I would have encouraged the president if I was on his staff, I would have said, Mr. President, you know how we leave? The country is secured. They're they're running all their own missions. Their police are investigating. You know, they're doing police work. Their soldiers are defending their borders, defending the interior. And it gets to the point where, you know, we shake hands with them. We say thank you. And we go to Kabul International Airport and we, you know, bo we have our soldiers board American Airlines or a, you know, a regular airline, get on the airplane, fly back to the United States, a lot of clapping, a lot of cheering. But if we can do that, if we have that much stability in a region, that in my book is called winning. And we were there, we were working on this. Uh, the program is called Village Stability Operations. And that's not classified, can be Googled, um, but it was working with the people, doing just that, giving them a leg to stand on. Like, hey guys, you know, here's a shoulder to cry on, shoulder to lean on. If you need help, we're here. Um, you know, you guys go and fight. If you need something a little, you know, a little extra, here's my phone number, give me a call and, you know, we'll, we'll back you up. And, and what I'm hearing you say right now is exactly what the attitude that I hear in your book, it's this encouragement. You That's why you are such an incredible leader. And that's why I believe that you were chosen for the missions that you were chosen for. And the ones that you volunteered for, I know they were saying, well, you were the person we wanted. And you can see why. You went on from fighting the Taliban. You were also fighting ISIS. So ISIS was really eliminated. And, and you had a big role in that. But that was where you were injured as well, because you were targeted. They were mad that you were so successful. And I think that's what people need to really understand, that when our servicemen go over there and they have a heart like yours, and you had a team of people, and, and one of those people on your team was Shannon Kent. We, I think a lot of our viewers or a lot of our listeners know her story from her husband who ran for Congress, um, Joe Kent. But you were there that day. And, and I think that when you talk about that day in the book, when you talk about the bombing, you talk about it in, in such detail because you even talk about Shannon's hair being pulled up and, and you looking at her and one of the last images in your mind of her is her smiling because of what you were able to accomplish just before that suicide bomber walks up who you describe as a demon. And so I want to I want to talk a little bit about that because fighting ISIS was was a part of you. That was you wanted to do that because you knew that that was what we needed to keep people here safe. But not only were you keeping people in the United States safe, you were creating a community over there that was allowing people to get medical attention, was allowing people to have energy, allowing d women to be educated. And and this happened. Tell me a little bit about that day. Yes. Yeah, so the, um, the three things that you mentioned were our three big things we had done for, I arrived in Syria in um, September of 2018 and I had four months yeah, four. Sorry, counting on my fingers. <laughs> uh, four months to fight ISIS. And my boss, uh, he was a colonel in charge of all special operations in Syria. 
the fight against ISIS, he gave me a simple command, go and defeat ISIS. I'm like, I'm one guy. Like, all right, let's do this. You know, pull my boot, put my boots on, grab my rifle, jumped on an airplane and picked up. We met my team who was there already assembled. They just needed a team leader. Uh, we did three big things. Uh, like you mentioned, the first big thing was uh, we restored a hydroelectric dam, restoring power to all of Northeast Syria, parts of Turkey, Iraq, and Jordan. Um, the last count was, is about 500,000 people we restored power to, which was a great thing. I mean, you flip the light switch on, you knew who had turned it on. Um, not necessarily, it wasn't not John Turnbull. It wasn't the United States of America. It was coalition working with um, the Syrian Democratic Council, but your local government, your government has got this, your government's turned the power on. Uh, so that was the first big one. He also said health, um, the health sector was very poor. Uh, so we rebuilt an entire hospital uh, focusing on emergency systems, uh, gave them ambulances working with the British and the French. Uh, so restored the whole health sector in my area that had about 10 to 20,000 people. So now they could go uh, receive medical attention. And which was really big for me because uh, I had I had a son and he was six years old at this time. And I couldn't imagine what, how do you, you know, what do you do as a mother when you give birth? And they're like, oh, you know, we just at home. I'm like, you don't go to the hospital. And they're like, what's a hospital? I'm like, ha ha, here we go. Um, wow. so helping them, giving them step up. And then, as you said, the final thing really blew my mind. We were visiting schools and I was trying to help the kids out. And at one point we learned no girls attended school in Northeast Syria. So we said, why not? And they're like, ISIS won't allow it. I'm like ISIS isn't in charge. You're in charge. Like talking to the government, you're in mm -hmm. charge. You make the rules. Like let's spit in the eye of ISIS, open schools back up to girls. Uh, one school, uh, in a small a village called the Dot opened this, their doors up for girls. Had 4,500 girls return to school in one day, just overnight. Click, girls return to school. Wow! It was a beautiful day. I'll always remember the day because it also was November 15th, which, as Michiganders, we know is very important. It's a religious day, deer season, but not just deer season for me. I sat there <laughs> while we, when the doors opened up and these kids flooded into these schools, and girls would come up to me. Uh, and we sit, went to the school actually that I was bombed at. I remember sitting there and they'd come to me and they're like, thank you. Um, and so they'd be shukran uh, in Arabic. Thank you, Nakib John, Captain John. Thank you. Thank you for letting us come to school. And they loved it. High fives, the hugs. I taught them how to fist bump. Like, hey, in America, we fist bump. They're like, oh, that's so cool. Really cool until you have the ambassador for the whole region come out and all the kids run up to him with their fists up like this. And he jumped in my car, freaking out. I'm like, <laughs> they're not going to beat you up. They want fist bumps. <laughs> it's good. But so we restored power, <laughs> provided them housing, or not housing, uh, health department, uh, hospital, open schools back up for kids to return to school. These three big things, ISIS was, uh, they were attacking the people and creating chaos and holding it over them. That way they were able to control the people through these three things. So by doing it, we removed the grip of ISIS over the people and we returned that control to the local government, the Senior Democratic Council. ISIS didn't like it. Uh, I mean, and we were also doing the army stuff, uh, finding bad guys and arresting them and things like that. Actually truly helping the missions that these three things were great because, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years out, you know, terrorist organizations will always rise up in these regions. Well, we want it. So, you know, they go into a village and they're like, hey, let's go and fight America, the West, all these, they're really bad. I want one of these, these kids to be like, hold on, America, let me go back to school. America turned our electricity back mm -hmm. on yes. and the West That's amazing. made it so my mom could go to the hospital when she was having problems. So why are they bad? So we, we have this long outlook and it's great. So ISIS didn't like this. Um, also, we were removing them from our region physically. And so on the day, on January 16th in 2019, about four months into my deployment, and my wife will tell you, the day after I was supposed to return home, because I was supposed to return on January 15th, but we were doing such a great job. My boss said, would you like to stay? And I said, yes. How else can I 
affect this amount of change in the world and make the world a better place. And to quote, um, oh, I can't remember what movie it is. Oh, Kingdom of Heaven with Orlando Bloom. One of his phrases in there, what is a man if he does not try to make the world a better place? And I think that's very true. Who are we if we do not try to make the world a better place? So I had a chance. So I volunteered to stay. We went to one of the schools. We were going to go and talk with the kids to see if there were any bad guys around because kids know. Um, and, you know, we're American military. We're really good at dealing with bad guys. Uh, went and went to the school, did all the fist bumps with all the little girls at school. And that's why Shannon was so happy. We went back to our trucks to get ready after the end of our mission. So finished our routine combat patrol, got back to our trucks, and we were going through a simple patrol brief, where we were going, how long it was going to take, what we were going to do, uh, why we were doing it, and just you know, just kind of giving, so clearing the field, let everybody know what's going on, uh, at which time the suicide bomber walked up, and just, a, I mean, the, the luck of this individual um, should not have happened. We had security. You know, I can't explain how it happened. Um, if he sneaked through or if he was, you know, he wasn't a genie, just poof, he was there, but something like that. But I do remember, yep, getting getting ready to get in my vehicle. It was, I remember seeing Shannon smiling because she was going to tell her boys, mommy's done something really good. Girls went back to school. Kids are happy and helpful and safe. And at the same time, I remember seeing uh, Chief Warrant Officer, Special Forces guy, so the toughest of the tough. His name is John Farmer. Guy, I'm pretty sure ate nails for breakfast. He was just that tough, just big guy. He was bouncing on his feet back and forth, making a little twirly motion with his finger, um, bouncing. I can read body language. He had to go to the bathroom and twirl his finger. He was saying, Turnbull, hurry it up. <laughs> Let's go so I can go back home, go to the bathroom, and I can call my wife and my kids and tell them how their daddy's a hero. Uh, and it was at that exact time that the suicide bomber walked between them both. And detonated his vest, and uh, yeah, ru ruined worst, worst day of my life, ruined the lives of four families. And rather than focusing on that negative and sad stuff, um, I decided to focus on the positive things. I decided my mission was now to cheer up the families because you can't replace that kind of loss. It's it's horrible, and I don't want to replace it. But rather than Focusing on that, I remember that, as mentioned in my book, my linguist who was killed, her name was Gadir Tahir. We referred to her as Jasmine, just easier to say. She kind of looked like the princess anyway. But she... Uh, <laughs> yes, yep, there's there a picture. So a picture. I agree. She's a beautiful woman. Uh, but always remember her mom was like, we met her and she was crying. And she asked me, she's like, John, why are you here? And why is my daughter not here? What did she do that made somebody want to kill mm -hmm. her? And again, rather than focusing on the negatives, we spent a whole day together and I actually get to spend the opportunity with her in April. I'm really excited. Um, I'm like, rather than focusing on the bad things, let me tell you how she lived. Let me tell you about how fiery and um, feisty your daughter was. And I talked about it in the book. Um, I'm not giving away all my secrets, but my favorite thing was we were talking about... Uh, we were going into a room that hadn't been, a bathroom that hadn't been opened since ISIS had left the area. Since we had removed them, they boarded it up and they wrote mines on the door. So saying that the room was, it had bombs in it. So we're briefing it and I had explosive ordnance to two Marines, um, a guy by the name of uh, Darius and Jared. They were briefing and as we're talking through it, Jasmine stood up and she's like, all right, guys. Before we go in, she's like, make sure you partner up with the EOD guys because I don't want any of you to kick off a booby trap. And I remember I was like, wait a minute. I'm sorry for the profanity, but I was like, did anybody just hear that? And like, what? And I was like, did you guys just hear Jasmine? She said booby. <laughs> and she slapped me um, and told me to grow up. Um, <laughs> but the fun things like that. like, and it may you do mention that you make a lot of people laugh that's, in the book, which you do. You are very, that's our goal. very you got, funny. You got to have some fun. And if we can't laugh at the situations, especially the situations we find ourselves in, then what's the point? So that's why I wrote the book um, mm -hmm. for this woman's name was Amina, Jasmine's mom. And then for a little tiny girl who right after while I was in the hospital, 
Um, she her dad, she was John Farmer's daughter, who I mentioned earlier, the Special Forces guy. Her name is Priscilla. I remember her asking me, Uncle John, you're my daddy's boss. I was like, yep, I'm your daddy's boss. She's like, can you order him to come home for Christmas? I miss my daddy. I was like, oh, God. Oh. Um, I'm like, I don't know what to do. And her mom is the most amazing woman ever. She's just like, John, just be tough. She's like, you be tough. You be tough for my John. John won't want you to cry. John wants you to be strong. I'm like, yes, ma'am. And so I wrote the book as a series of letters to the family members being like, once again, let me tell you how they lived. The funny things, the happy things, the things they did, running, working out on the, the place, going through the, uh, mentioned Joe Kent earlier. I remember sitting down with him uh, while I was at the hospital again. He sat down with us and we were able to talk with him. And I was like, hey, did, did Shannon send home, I mean, I'm going to, probably lowball the number, but like a thousand scarves. And he's like, oh, dear Lord, yes. She sent home boxes and boxes of scarves. And I'm like, we're sorry. She would go into town and she'd pick up food for us, like hamburgers or something fantastic. There's always shawarma. But um, the best goat meat you could find. And she'd bring it to us. And she wouldn't let us pay. She was she was like a um, like a mother figure. She had to take care of her, take care of her boys. So she was always there giving us food. And she wouldn't let us pay for it, but she loved scarves. So we would buy her scarves from the local market and we would pay her in scarves. And so it's kind of funny. I was like, sorry, Joe, about all those scarves. Um, yeah, I, I helped the Syrian economy quite well with uh, sc- their scarf making and gave them all yeah. Shannon. <laughs> but that was the point. And I, and I was like, I want Shannon's boys, um, Josh and Colton. I want them when they grow up because they were, I mean, they were babies when Shannon was killed very little ones. Uh, and I want them, if they don't remember their mom, I want them to have something that can be like, that was my mom. And uh, same thing with Priscilla and her brother Preston, who are now eight or nine years old. I want them when they grow up to, if they can't remember, like, I don't remember what my daddy was like. Let me tell you what your daddy was like. And this is book, 0% Chance. It was written for these four families. So multiple letters, we ended up putting them together chronologically to outline the deployment, but then it gets into after the explosion, so explosion, um, which killed four Americans, killed Chief Warrant Officer John, John Farmer, Chief Petty Officer Shannon Kent, killed Petty Officer Second Class uh, Scott Wirtz, and Miss Gadir Tahir, also known as Jasmine, to our friends and family. So these four people, it also killed 19 Syrians um, on that day. So we traveled with eight soldiers um, on my team. Immediately, half of my team was killed. Uh, myself, I was blown to the ground. My right eye, you can see the flap I have over here. It's a skin flap holding my face together. Um, right eye was blown out of my head. My left eye was punctured pretty badly. Shrapnel wounds were really gross, and I'll go with the word icky. Uh, two other soldiers were also wounded, a guy by the name of Devin, and then another guy by the name of Joe. And then we had one soldier who was uninjured, physically uninjured, um, spiritually and mentally it was, that's where his assault came because he had to pick up body parts after the explosion. Um, all this being said, a few hours later, Americans landed. Uh, we called in an immediate medevac request for help, medical evacuation, so medevac. A helicopter landed. It was my boss, that colonel I told you about earlier, who was in, in charge of the whole yeah. area. He landed big, burly American, like probably one of the greatest leaders I've ever met. The person when I grow up, I want to be just like him. Um, <laughs> great person landed. They found me. They found my two guys that were wounded. And they evacuated us to another spot in Syria, then to Iraq. I went from Iraq to Turkey, or well, not to Turkey, excuse me, to uh, Germany. And after a few weeks in Germany, they patched me up. I went to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, right outside of D.C., where I spent. Uh, yep. Well, I, I think I want to stop you here because I think it's important to mention that what you did to bring medical services to that area in Syria actually saved your life as well, because it was one of the ambulances that you brought in that you actually were taken out in, correct? Yes. Yeah. So the the way things, I mean, we did, you never plan for things, um, but you always, mm-hmm. Sun Tzu said, you know, you uh, 
pray for pray for the best, prepare for the worst. Uh, paraphrasing that's a really bad paraphrase, but you understand. Um, I mean, the reason we write uh, right. death letters home and stuff, but yes, uh, I was. We provided uh, ambulance service to the region. Um, the British actually provided the ambulances, and um, then so we were. Put, I was put into an ambulance. I was taken to the hospital that we rebuilt and we worked with the Germans. The Germans provided a whole bunch of equipment, x-ray machines, ultrasound machines, surgical equipment, all the stuff you needed. Uh, and then American State Department, our State Department provided, brought doctors in who taught triage. Um, so who lives, who dies, how do you fix up wounds for this? And also how to package up people in case things are so bad they can't stay there that they need to go somewhere else. Uh, so it, it, I was in an ambulance. I went to the ER in this hospital where the equipment we had brought in, they worked on us. The doctors who had the training from American doctors fixed me up and I came and landed in a specially made area. I'm going to make it try and make it sound really cool. Special Forces guys set up a helicopter landing zone, HLZ, for a hot extract. Hot means stuff happening, there's combat, um, things are bad, but it's safe enough for a hel Black Hawk helicopter to land. People got out. And I, I tried to make it sound really cool. It was a soccer field. Um, <laughs> but, um, I mean, it's still but, pretty cool. I mean, it, it, it's pretty amazing to think about it. And, and at this time, I'm just going to hold up your book yes. one more time, because at this time, this is when you hear the doctor say you, he gives you a 0% chance. Yeah, they, and that's why you named the book 0% chance. Yep, yeah, through, the, through the two years I spent um, in my recovery, I was given a 0% chance many times. And I'm not going to bash any of our doctors, and I'm not gonna, I'll make fun of them, though. They weren't wrong. <laughs> um, I, on my flight from Syria to Iraq, my heart rate went to zero and my respirations went to zero, which I guess medically that's considered dead. Um, I, have, I even have a time of death written in my medical records. Um, wow. Not good for the life insurance policy, but yeah, that's not here or there. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I died. The surgeon it was amazing. The surgeon was like, all right, Turnbull's dead. There were other people on the airplane. Work on these other guys. You know, fix them up. This guy, you know, as a flight surgeon, has been to college for up teen years and, you know, the best of the best. But there was a young man on that flight, and uh, let's go with his first name. His name was first name was Corey, a specialist. So not an officer, not e even a non-commissioned officer, a low-ranking soldier, was a medic, and he got it under his skin. He's just like, oh yeah. He's like, let me show you what your you know your your PhD didn't teach you. And he's like, not breathing, whatever. So we do breaths, heart not beating. Your chest compressions, that's called CPR. This young man, and I, I ingest, but this young man did CPR on me for four hours. The whole flight it took to get from that Syria into Iraq. Um, and by the time we had landed, I was breathing on my own and my heart rate had returned. So it was Corey, in my opinion, was an angel um, sent by God, or he was for sure an individual sent by God given the stamina to perform CPR for four hours. Like, who does that? Um, mm. st stamina, the stubbornness, termination, tenacity, all these, you know, adjectives to describe this guy. And they wheeled me off. And again, the, you know, the doctor gave his report to, or the flight surgeon, excuse me, gave his report to the hospital doctor in Baghdad. And um, the hospital doctor in Baghdad, his name was Kyle. I asked, what was wrong with this guy? Because he's like, you're pretty ugly. I'm like, I've always been ugly. He's like, no, you're, you were missing your face. And I was like, that's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but he said, the flight surgeon said, Turnbull died on the flight over. He's like, he's not going to make it. He's like, I'm giving him 0% chance of surviving 24 hours. So Kyle, you know, cracked his knuckles and we can't drink downrange. So I mean, it's a, just a phrase, but said, here, hold my beer and started to work on me. <laughs> and I later was able to meet Kyle in my hospital room. And while he was in my room, Samantha, my wife, was there. And I remember him telling her, he's like, you can't be here. And she's like, oh, I can't? He's like, no, you can't be here. 
She's like, I'm sorry, are you guys going to talk like secret stuff? I can leave. He's like, no, 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 no. He's like, no, you, like, there's no way you can be here because there's no way John's here. He's like, he's dead. Like, John couldn't have survived. He's mm. like, what I saw, there's no way John survived. And this guy opened up to me and said, wow. John, there's one reason why you survived. And we have a few seconds to get mushy about it. He's like, before the explosion, he's like, John, I was an atheist. Didn't believe in God. I was a doctor, uh, you know, like a, a surgeon, a great surgeon. There's no God. He's like, but this bomb happened. I had uh, a piece of shrapnel go into my iliac artery in my groin. This doctor happened to specialize in, of all things, arteries and, uh, you know, arterial repair, artery stuff, stuff with your arteries. Um, he was the one doctor in the Middle East, not the one, not the one, but in the Middle East, especially in our region of our conflict, the one doctor that could save my life with my artery being torn open. So he's like, John, I, we fixed you up. And I sat back and I was like, how did the, you know, this explosion happen to this one guy? And he was flown all over the, these different places. And he comes to me by, by chance, by, um, uh, He's like, no such thing as chance. Mm -hmm. He's like, if it weren't for the father above, he's like, I would have never, you would have never come to me. You would have just died. With anybody else, you would have died. He's like, so I had to sit back. He's like, in that moment, it's like, I became a Christian. I remember some of the Bible stories that I heard about Jesus and how Jesus wow. helped everything out. And he's like, in that one moment, I knew there was a God. He's like, I prayed and I said, I'm sorry for what, what, you know, for denying you all this time? It's like, thank you. It's like, John, you were injured. It's like, I don't want to say you're injured just from, but it's like, thank you. You've saved me. You've saved my family. He's like, and I can go on living. He's like, but that, it, so just absolutely amazing. But he still couldn't believe, he kept touching me, like, he kept like hitting me. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm seeing if you're real. And I'm like, I'm real. <laughs> um, he's like, you're not dead. I'm like, I don't think so. I mean, like, I lost my eyesight, so I can't see, so I can't really verify that I'm here on Earth. <laughs> but I mean, like, sounds, smells were good. But it was amazing. Um, all these people coming, uh, like, and that's the second part of the book. It's talking about the people that came together. Uh, America, Americans are amazing. We're amazing. What makes us amazing is that we care, and we care about each other. I think that you probably saw a side of President Trump that people talk about, but we don't really hear about. So I definitely want you to share that. My caveat is everything I'm about to say and everything that I have said is unclassified to the best of my knowledge. Um, yeah, so we're, now we're all covered. Um, <laughs> so NSA, when listening in, this is all unclassified. So you don't have to listen. Um, <laughs> but President Trump came to visit me a few days after the explosion uh, came to the hospital. I was in the ICU and I was really sick. Uh, my wife said that I was, fluids were coming out of me, not just both ends, but like literally out of me, like all and then gushing and it was, it was icky. Um, President Trump met with my two soldiers that were also wounded and they, they just kept talking about this guy. They kept talking about Captain John Turnbull, their leader. They're like, Mr. President, you've got to meet him. He loves you. He thinks you're awesome. So President Trump, you know, came up to my room in the ICU. And in order to gain access to a room, you have to ask permission to enter. My wife, Samantha, was there. And so he's like, may I enter your, your husband's room? This woman, she says, no. <laughs> and... He was taken quite a bit back and was like, no. She's like, Mr. President, in all honesty, John has, I had the flu type, whatever, influenza. I had E. coli. I was coughing up blood. I had chunks of metal coming out of me. My guts were splayed open. It's like, John's in a bad place. He had a breathing tube and even she's like, if I allow you in there to meet him and he can't talk with you, he'll be crushed. It's like, so Mr. President, can you please come back? My wife turned him away, um, but it gets better. He comes back. Yeah, she's yeah, she's amazing. Um, but in November of twenty, yeah, it's twenty twenty. So November of twenty twenty, during his reelection campaign, 
I had my very last surgery. I had uh, eyeball stuff done. And I mean, you can see I have this eyeball, it's a prosthetic. I uh, had an ear replacement, the cochlear implant. I had my uh, a bilateral incision on my stomach, a uh, abdominal wall reconstruction. I was in pretty rough shape. Um, but it was my last surgery. Yeah, I made it. I defeated the odds. Zero percent chance. Zero percent chance when I survived. It's a hundred percent God at work. Um, so, you know, like I was, I was all excited. We we're getting ready to leave the hospital, and I did, you know, have doctors sign my report card, you know, my hall pass, so to speak. And um, one of them said, "No, you're not allowed to leave." And I was like, "Why not?" And he's like. I'm giving you a direct order. You cannot leave until this date and time, tomorrow morning, nine o'clock or whatever time it was. I would need you to report to the gymnasium. Do not bring a cell phone. Do not bring any cameras. Don't bring any recording devices, iPads, any of that stuff, computers. Just show up just in your clothes and we'll be, we'll, something's going to happen. I'm like, all right, cool. So my wife and I walked down to the gym. And it's a place I love because I'm an army guy. I like working out. I went to the gym. They rammed the pipe cleaners up my nose, uh, you know, checking for COVID. COVID clean. They, I walked through a metal detector. Yeah, pipe cleaners. It's look like COVID's over. Because I also had my nose redone. Um, having stuff in there. You know. But uh, we go in there, get padded down, no cell phones, no technology. Uh, wait around with about 20 or so other veterans or soldiers that were there being treated. When President Trump walks into the room, we're all like, Whoa, what's what's going on? Very first thing President Trump says, he's like, Bet you guys wonder why I say you can't have cell phones, cameras, all these. It's like, you're not gonna I don't want you to have any recording devices for this. He's like, you don't see any news agency here. Nobody's taking pictures except for <laughs> wow. official White House uh photographers are taking pictures. But he's like, I have a reason. It's like this isn't about re election, you know, Donald Trump's re election campaign. He's like, I don't want the American people to see all over the news. Look at him going and schmoozing with wounded warriors. He's like, nope, it's not why I'm doing this. He's like, I'm here on behalf of Donald Trump, the Trump family, and the American people. He's like, I just want to sit, tell you guys, thank you for your service, and come around and shake our hands. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was his why we didn't have phones uh, during his reelection. He was there to meet with us and spent time with us one on one. He talked with everybody for about five minutes. We listened to what they had to say. He listened. Um, he didn't just hear them, um, responded in kind. And it was fabulous. And he got to my wife and I. We were the very last ones. So they're running out of time. You know, helicopters, rotors are spinning, getting ready to take off. Like he had to get out of there. We started talking. And this guy is the most amazing individual. I mentioned John Farmer's two youngest children, Preston and Priscilla, earlier. They met President Trump uh, when John was brought home to Dover. Um, and he was returned to his family. President Trump was there, helped, you know, shook hands with the families, hugged the kids. So he met them real briefly. Uh, President Trump walks up to me and my wife, Samantha, and he says, you know, they start reading my bio, bio being like, John Turnbull was injured. And, and President Trump said, stop. He told us to stop. He's like, I remember 2019, right? Early. I'm like, yes, Mr. President. He's like, suicide bombing. I'm like, yes, Mr. President. He's like, I'm going to ask you some Real tough questions. Like, what's up, Mr. President? He's like, how are Preston and Priscilla doing? John Farmer's kids. I mean, who is this guy? Like, one, how does he remember their names? And uh, all of our liberal friends out there will be like, he didn't remember them. He asked, you know, he had headphones in. Somebody was prompting him. If that's the case, yes, I will agree with you. He was prompted on it. But how does he know what to be prompted on? Mm. Do they know this stuff? No. He told them to, hey, when I meet Turnbull, prompt me on this. So that was his priority. He wanted to know about the families. So we talked about the families and how they were doing and the kids were struggling at the time. And he got really choked up when I was like, oh, they, you know, when I asked him, Priscilla asked me to have her daddy come home for right. Christmas. Mm. And he's like, he is home. I mean, he's in Arlington, but he's, he's home in here. And in here, he's like, you tell them that. Um, and tell them that, you know, Uncle Donald Trump loves them. And if they need anything, they call and they have, and he's, he's good to with his word. Um, but if I can tell you one other real quick uh, story about him that was really funny. So he, in the middle of this campaign, mm. um, we remember how, you know, campaign have their ups and their downs. Uh, I think that around this time, he's having one of his downs. Um, so, I mean, much like 
yourself when we met. Um, I mean, you didn't have any downs. You're, you're always on top, in my opinion. But uh, I like it. You're just like, hey, you know, tell, tell me something nice. Let's, uh, you know, let's let's have some fun. Let's have some yeah. laughter. Tell me something nice. President Trump said the same thing. He's like, John. He's like, I'm having a rough time of this. He's like, the news just beat me up. Tell me something good. I remember telling him, I was like, Mr. President, my wife's eight Aww. months pregnant. We were expecting our second child in about one or two months. And he's like, what? I was like, my wife's pregnant. He's like, everybody, because everybody, we, you know, a bunch of people crowding around. He's like, everybody, quiet. He's like, say it again. I was like, Sam's like, I'm expecting, Mr. President. He's like, this? He's like, this is what I wanted to hear. This is amazing. He's like, but, John, how did this happen? <laughs> and my beautiful wife's like, Mr. President, if you don't know by now, it's too late, <laughs> which got everybody laughing about it. And, you know, he laughed. But this the, this man, and this is the man, Donald Trump, that we know all that we met. He told his dad, he's like, I've got to do something for them. He's like, write on your notepad, do something for the Turnbulls. This is great, and, <laughs> which is which is wonderful to have, you know, congratulations from the president especially, you know, the man, you know, this really evil man, you know, mean man that the news portrays. Um, you know, he's just very kind, magnanimous, a wonderful, humble individual. Um, he, it was the President Trump that we've seen. He's not all talk. I mean, he talks a big game, but he delivers. Uh, the next day we were able to leave. Once again, I was right. going out and getting all these signatures. Uh, the same doctor that was like, uh-uh, go to the gym. Told me again, uh uh-uh, go first to the, um, he said, go to the presidential wing of Walter Reed, and then I'll give you your signature. So we go up there and we're Mm -hmm. like, what are we doing up here? His aide, President Trump's aide was there and was like, oh, President Trump left you this. And he gave us a uh, a pewter plate with the presidential seal in the middle of it. And I like to tell my wife that there's also a lipstick kiss on it from Melania. She says it's not there, but now I know who the real blind one is. It's her. Um... (laughs) But he left us that with a little note saying, thank you. Um, I love being with you guys. He's like, you guys are Americans. You're what America, you know, needs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And just was very generous. Um, <laughs> left us a really cool plate. But it wasn't just that. When we'd gotten home, we, ret- we drove back to North Carolina. Um, within a day or so, we had a big box from the White House on our front porch, which had a rattle in it, a little stuffed animal bear. And a bunch, another note from President Trump just being like, hey, thank you so much for what you told me. I mean, this guy was incredible. And remember, we were told, told him, we're like, hey, Mr. President, you know, like, because he asked everyone there, he's like, hey, what can I do to make Walter Reed, the medical hospital, oh, wow. what can I do to make it better? What can I do to make the army better? Is there any suggestions for making America better uh, or making the world better? And I love, I love this, how his approach was. And I remember we are like, well, Mr. President, like, honestly, fire your social media team because they suck. Um, And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, because if America could see you like this, like we see you right now, it's like, you don't have to run for re-election. We will demand that you be re-elected. Oh, wow. You know, and we hear so many stories like that about the true Donald Trump. And I am so grateful to you that you shared this with us because I think people need to hear that this is the type of stuff that he does, and he's not asking for credit. No, he, he was not. And he's, you know, he didn't wave it. Like the news that did come out from it was somebody snapped a picture of him getting on to Air Force One helicopter, and you've got the rotor wash, so it's blowing down really hard. His mask went down below his nose. So, what did the news hit up? Donald Trump, you know, at the hospital, not wearing his mask right. Really, guys? Come on now. Let's, you know, you're. <laughs> I always liked um, the was the show uh, oh Crossfire with uh, those the guys on CNN when they they brought on John Stewart one time and John Stewart said the best thing I loved it right before Crossfire was canceled he said stop you're hurting America let's come together let's build up America let's wow. be positive mm-hmm. stop hurting America and that's I mean if I ever had a chance to go on and talk with those folks I would want to be like John Stewart and say all right let's stop say something good. I mean, how hard is it to say something positive? I mean, you can we can turn everything negative and be like, oh, you know, it's it's so gross outside. It's 20 degrees out. Well, it's, you know, we're alive and the sun is shining. 
let's be positive about it. And that's what I lo loved about my journey this was the positivity. Um, maintained, I've always maintained a positivity journal rather than you know, every time I think of something bad or sad, I try to replace the sad thought or bad thought with two positive ones, something fun. And that's how it came about with the book. Um, rather than focusing on negative, let's be positive and we can make the world a better place. And I think that's a good principle that all well, people thank can you. By. Be and And that is why I wanted to share you with as many people as I could, because that's exactly what I felt when I met you. And reading this book, I really, I'm going to hold it up again. Zero percent chance. It is a page turner. You can't put it down. You, you're so honest and open and just like you are today. That's why I wanted people to hear from you because you tell the story that a lot of our veterans can't tell. So I appreciate that you were willing to share this with us today. Thank you, Major Jonathan Turnbull, author of Zero Percent Chance. I hope everybody goes out and gets their own copy because this is really a true, raw story about the lives of our service members and the sacrifices that you all make for us. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Tudor Dixon podcast. For all of the people that are listening for this episode and others, go to TudorDixonPodcast.com. You can subscribe right there and join me next time on the Tudor Dixon podcast. Have a great day. And Major, thank you so much for joining me.